welcome back everyone for today's video we are going to be taking a look at the crunch lab masters which is part of the chess champions tour and being held on chess.com now the first game we're going to be looking at is a game between vladimir kramnik the infamous former world champion and someone who has been very outspoken in terms of accusing everybody that he plays online who beats him of cheating now this game we're looking at was played in the armageddon portion so kramnik and aroni were playing in division two they split the first two games with a rapid chess one one and an armageddon kramnik starts with 10 minutes versus aroni with roughly seven minutes and 30 seconds and kramnik must win with the white pieces in order to not lose the game and in order to spare us from another very long rant on twitter so the game starts out with the move knight to f3 aronian plays d5 we get g3 g6 bishop g2 bishop g7 and now cram decides castle here aronian plays move knight f6 eschewing the traditional line with e5 here where you get the big black center and the two pawns in the middle of the board so we get knight to f6 now the move d3 is played by Kramnik, Aronian castles. We get knight d2, knight c6, e4, e5, c3, and now this move a5 here, trying to stop white from expanding on the queen side. If white could get a move like let's say b4 and then potentially b5, you can kick the knight away and try to win this pawn on the e5 square. So Aronian goes for this move a5 here to stop b4. We get a4, and now we have the move h6 being played. Black wants to bring the bishop to the e6 square, but if you were to do it right away, white can potentially harass the bishop on e6 by moving this knight to the g5 square. So we get h6 here, covering the square and intending to play for bishop e6. Game continues with rook e1. We get the move rook e8, and now we have the move queen c2 being played by Cranmer. Here, Aronian goes bishop e6. We got pawn takes pawn, bishop takes pawn, and now we have the move b3 being played, where Kramnik wants to fianchito the bishop to b2 and potentially play c4, opening up the long scope for this b on c1. So we get queen d7, bishop b2. Now, rook a d8 is played, and here Kramnik goes rook d1. We got the move knight h7. And now Kramnik plays h4. Now, while Kramnik would love to go c4 in this position, the big issue is that because white has pushed this pawn to a4, you always create this huge juicy square for the horse on b4, and you end up with a nice bastion where the knight forks the queen and the pawn at the same time. So we get h4 here. Aronian goes f5, we get queen b1, queen f7, and now c4 is played because knight to b4 no longer has the same venom as the queen is no longer on the c2 square. Get bishop takes knight, bishop takes bishop, and now the move knight before is played, going after this pawn on d3, but also stopping white from moving the bishop to the d5 square. Kramnik plays knight f1, we get c6 here, trying to stop white from winning the pawn, but again, also covering this critical square. Kramnik goes bishop g2, Aronian plays g5, and now we get this move knight h2. Now at this point, it's very clear that Aronian is sort of pushing Kramnik around on the board. He's down about a minute and a half on the clock, but Black has great control of the center, weak pawn on d3 permanently targeted by the Bastion. You can always play for f4, e4, and the king side is potentially opening up as well. So here Aronian trades the pawns on h4, and now rather inexplicably, he plays this move knight to f6, sacrificing a pawn. Now this is a very big mistake what Aronian should have done, was played knight to f8 here, intending to go knight g6, hitting the pawn on h4, or putting the knight on f4. Now the reason this is so much better is because when Aronian goes knight f6, now white can take the pawn on e5, and even though you're trying to get the knight to f4, you've given away this pawn for simply no reason. So Kramnik goes d4. Aronian trades the bishops, trades the rooks, trades everything, and now goes knight to f4. Now, Aronian has these knights here, the knight anchored on b4, the knight on f4 hitting the bishop. Maybe a knight can jump to d3, and optically, it looks very good for black, but you are down a pawn in the middle of the board in this situation, and you're also down a minute and a half on the clock. So here, Kramnik plays bishop f1, which is a big mistake. Computer wants white to play the move queen to f3 here, going after the knight. If black brings the knight to d3 after bishop f1, checking king h1, queen guards the pawn, queen also hits the knights on f4 and d3, and white is simply winning the game. Instead, we get the move bishop f1, Aronian plays queen g7, king h1, queen takes e5, and at this point, it's looking very, very likely that we're going to get another explosion on Twitter from Kramnik because he's simply in a lot of trouble here. He in a lot by When I say he's in a lot of trouble, what I mean is that it's going to be very hard to win the game. So Kramnik plays queen d8 check, we get king to g7, queen d7, Aronian goes king g6, and now Kramnik plays this move h5, simply sacrificing a pawn and trying to stop this knight on f4 from remaining so active. Aronian plays move king f6 instead, we get queen h7, 
queen e4, king g1, and now Aroni makes a slight mistake with the move knight c2. Computer, I think, wants king g5 here, simply arguing the king cannot be attacked, but it feels very loose bringing this king out right in the line of fire. Knight f3, bishop e2, queen g7. It simply feels a little bit counterintuitive. So we get the move knight c2. Queen takes pawn is played, king to f7, we get check, king f8, queen h8, king f7, and now the move h6 is played. Here, Aronian plays the move knight to d4, bringing these knights to the center, trying to checkmate the white king. Now, if white were to play h7, for example, you go knight check, takes, and you have queen g2, checkmating the king in one move. So, Kramnik plays queen g7, we get king e6, and now we have the shocking move h7 being played in this position. Now, this move loses the game immediately here. There is no reason for black to not win. So Kramnik, not Kramnik, sorry, Aronian plays knight e2. We got bishop takes knight. And here with 43 seconds on, on the clock, the former world number two in the world, probably one of the top five players by quality of play ever to play the game of chess, misses a four checkmate. This position, it's game over if black plays knight h3 check. King has no squares on these two, these two squares, g2 and h1. Queen covers, only move. And after queen to h1, king has no escape square. Queen g1 is the only move. And after queen takes g1, it's simply checkmate. And the game ends immediately. Shockingly, Aroni spends next to no time here. Two seconds before playing knight takes bishop, missing the force checkmate. And after king to f1, knight to f4, now Kramnik can play check, king d7. And after Kramnik sacks the queen for the knight on f4 here, it's all over. We get queen takes queen. Pawn promotes to a queen. Now white has an extra horse on the board. And not only having an extra horse on the board, but Kramnik is up a minute and a half, and the game is over. So the game concludes shortly. We get queen e4, queen h3, king d6, king g1, check, king g2, check, queen f3, queen e5, queen d3, king c5, knight f3, queen back here. And eventually, Kramnik goes on to win this game after this move. Queen takes c5, and... We get this position right here, where after queen c1, Levon, I think, runs out of time. Now, I went through those last 20 moves very quickly, but the result was really never in doubt after Aroni missed the fourth checkmate in three. And Kramnik gets a massive miracle to survive. It probably spares the chess world, at least for a day, from more nonsense online. But it is what it is. So unfortunately for Aronian, with that loss in the Armageddon game, he is eliminated from Division 2. That means that Kramnik moves on to the next round. All right. Next game we're going to be taking a look at is played in Division 1. It features a five-time world champion against Wesley So, one of the top players from America, perennial top five, top ten player. Now, remember, Magnus lost his match yesterday at MVL, which relegated him to the loser's bracket of Division 1. So if he loses another match, he is eliminated. It is finito, and he will not be competing anymore. So, the game we're looking at also is Armageddon. Wesley and Magnus both being rock-solid players drew the two rapid games and our Megadon game. Magnus is playing with a white piece against Wesley. Remember, yesterday with the white piece against Maxime, he was unable to win the game, and Maxime moved on. All right, Magnus with the white piece and Armageddon must win. He plays move E4, and now we get E5. Wesley bidding 7 minutes, I believe, in 18 seconds, or 7.17, um, which is why he had the black pieces. So we get knight f3, knight c6, and now Magnus plays the classic Italian or the Gucci piano, as we affectionately call it. We have bishop c5, castles, knight f6, d3, d6, c3, and now this move a5 is played to stop white from expanding with b4. Now keep in mind, I've played a lot of lines with h6, so Magnus could go for the bishop g5 lines, but he chooses not to. We get rookie one, castles, h3, now we have h6, bishop b3, bishop e6, and the move bishop c2. What Magnus is doing here is he's trying to keep all the pieces on the board. White has two Bs, two Knights, two Rooks, and a Queen. In a game where you must win with the white pieces, or in general when you must win, it tends to be better if you can keep as many pieces on the board as possible, which is why Magnus chooses to retreat the Bishop. Here, Wesley plays the move Bishop A7. We get Knight D2, and now the move D5 is played. And Wesley has built the classic big black center with the pawns on E5 and D5. Magnus trades on d5, and now he goes queen e2, trying to target the pawn on the e5 square. Wesley goes rook e8. We get knight f1 here. Idea maybe to put the knight on g3 or just develop the bishop to e3 to counteract the strong dark square b that black has on this a7 square. So we get the move rook a d8, knight g3, b5 is played, and now bishop e3 from Magnus. Here, Magnus decides to trade the bishops primarily because after takes, takes, 
Black has pushed these pawns on the queen side up a little bit, and this pawn on e5 is under pressure. And black also can't really attack this white center. Pawns on b2 and c3 are compact. Bishop guards a pawn on d3. So the weakness on e5 and black having pushed these pawns to a5 and b5, Magnus assumes that he is going to get some chances. So Wesley goes bishop c8 here, trying to protect the pawn on e5 with the knight, the rook, and the queen. Magnus goes knight e4, we get knight takes, pawn takes, and now the move queen d6. Now, probably Wesley thought, okay, one less piece on the board. I've traded the knights off, and now it's only bishops and knight. But the problem here is that Wesley has pushed these pawns on the queen side, and Magnus senses that there is something that he can do. So he plays rook d1. You get queen e7 here. If you were to move the queen to, let's just say, e6 potentially, now white can go to c5, and there are all kinds of problems. The pawn on e5 is pressured. The knight is pressured. The pawns over here are pressured. And black is in a lot of trouble. When you add in the fact that white can go bishop b3 and claim the long diagonal, this is simply overwhelming for white. So we get queen e7, which stops queen to c5 here in the position. But now Magnus plays rook d5, an excellent move here, creating the kebab on the fifth rank. And once again, all these pawns are under massive pressure. Now, if Wesley were to trade the towers here, the problem is that pawn attacks a knight, you move the knight. And here, white can probably just take the pawn. Even queen takes is good. White is simply up a pawn in the middle of the board. Let's just say takes, takes, takes. And at this point, with an extra pawn in the center, these weak pawns that can easily be targeted here on the queen side, white is simply winning. So, Wesley goes b4. But now the problem is that Magnus plays bishop a4, and the knight is pinned on the c6 square. And at this point, it's clear that Wesley will lose the game, because the knight is under pressure, which guards the two pawns. You've got the kebab here, combined with all the forces. It's just too much. Wesley goes bishop b7, bishop takes knight, takes, rook takes a5. Another very nice move from Magnus, eliminating a pawn on the edge of the board while targeting the pawn on e5. And if black were to trade on c3, now you hit the pawn on e5 again, you hit the bishop on the pawn, and you also have two pawns on the queen side, the a, these a and b pawns that you can just start flinging up the board. So Wesley goes queen d6, Magnus plays queen c5, another sublime move. Forcing an end game here, and in an end game with a knight versus a b, and these outside pawns that you can push, it's all but hopeless. Wesley struggles on with pawn takes pawn. We get queen takes pawn, f6 played here, and now rook c5 from Magnus, creating the double stack, potentially a triple stack down the road, and a kebab on the seventh rank. We get rook e6, b4 being played, rook b8, and now knight to h4, jumping with the horse to f5 or g6. Switch cheese here. Pawns are on the wrong square, so both these squares on g6 and f5 are very attractive for the horse. And now Wesley plays king h7, knight f5, queen d7, and now we get the move a4 from Magnus. Computer would have preferred the triple stack, but nonetheless, a4 is good enough. We get rook c8, b5, bishop a8, and now the move a5 from Magnus, simply pushing his p up the queen side. Black has no counterplay here. The knight on f5 is perfectly placed. You have the double stack to pressure the pawn, and you're just flinging p up the board. We get rook e8, f3 from Magus, a nice finishing touch. Now the bishop is basically dead. No pressure on the diagonal for the rest of the game here. And now white can triple stack. You can push b6, a6, and it's all but over. We get c6, b6, bishop b7. And now queen b3 played by Magus, trying to potentially play rook to d1 and claim the lane, or even potentially a6 and push the b pawn up the board. We get rook d8, Magus goes rook c, c1. We get c5, rook, c, d, rook e, d1. Claiming the lane or the d-file, Wesley plays c4. We get rook takes queen, pawn takes queen, rook takes pawn, king h8. And now Magnus very calmly plays the move rook to b1, eliminating this pawn on b3. And with that, Wesley should resign. We get bishop a6, rook b3, rook c2, rook c7, rook a2. And now after b7, rook g8, and the move knight to e3, Wesley so resigns the game. Magnus also could have played g4 here as well. But there are no issues whatsoever after knight e3. As you guard the pawn on g2 with the knight, you're threatening to push the pawn. If rook b8 is played to stop the pawn here, probably many different ways for white to win. But probably the cleanest, in my opinion, is to very simply go rook c8 check. Takes, takes, takes. Rook to b8, pinning the bishop. And after check, king h2 and rook c1. Now you go a6 with the idea of a7 and a8 to get a queen. Best move is rook c7, a7, takes, takes, extra horse, and no shot to survive. So a very, very crushing, a very impressive performance in the Armageddon game by Magus to win with the white pieces. With that win, he moves on to the next round in Division 1, while Wesley So is eliminated from the loser's bracket and the whole competition. All right, 
So the third and final game we're going to be looking at is my game, which I'm playing in Division 2. So I am in the loser's bracket in Division 2. In the first match of the day, I won against, if I remember, I don't remember who I beat, Maxim Matlakov. And now in the second match of the day, I'm playing against Vasiv Durabeli from Azerbaijan. So in the first game with the white pieces, I played a very slow line within the Queen's Indian. It was a very sharp game. Probably at some point, I was much worse. But I was able to win in the time scramble to to take advantage of the take advantage and move into the lead with a score of 1-0. So this is the second game. In this game, I'm playing with the black pieces. Vasif must beat me. If he does not win the game with the white pieces, he is eliminated. So it's essentially the same as Armageddon. All right. Game starts with e4. I play e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, bishop knight f6, d3, and here I play the move h6 once again in the classic Gucci piano. Now, as I mentioned in the Magus game versus Wesley, Bishop C5 was played allowing Bishop G5, but I simply play the move H6, stopping Bishop G5 very early on. We've got the move castles, Bishop C5, C3, D6, and here Vasiv plays B4. Now, again, West, this could transpose to something very similar to Wesley's game, but the difference is because I've played H6, I've at least eliminated a bunch of these Bishop G5 opportunities so we get b4 bishop b6 a4 i play a5 if i were to castle after a5 is uh oh spaghetti -o time bishop is trapped there are no squares available here every square that the bishop can move to it is going to be captured so play a5 b5 97 here trying to rotate the horse to g6 in in the spanish or in the italian many times you'll see both sides try to put the knights on um let, let, just to illustrate something where both sides try to put the knights on g3 and f3 or g6 and f6 here main reason is because a lot of the play revolves around the pawn push whether it's white pushing d4 to get the big white center uh just to illustrate it whether it's white going like something like this if white gets this the knight generally is very good for guarding the pawn on e4 but also can jump to h5 or f5 and the same thing is applicable for black when you look at this position Generally, black wants to play something like c6 and then d5, and the knight on g6 also guards the pawn on e5 while threatening to jump to h4, f4 down the road. So that's why a lot of these Italians and Spanishes, both sides try to rotate the knights to g6 and g3 squares because then they can support the central pawn push and the knights guard these critical pawns from being captured. So knight e7, we get the move bishop e3. This is a move that while I was live streaming the game, I thought was a little bit dubious in my opinion, simply because in a must-win situation, trading off pieces this early, it feels a little bit wrong. So you get bishop e3, I swap the juicers, I go knight g6, queen b3, castles, knight d2, and now I play this move c6 here, trying to build a big black center with the connect three, or connect four, I should say, and everything supporting this pawns on e5 and d5. Here, Vasif played the move d4 very quickly. Now, I did spend nearly one minute on this move because what I expected to happen was takes, takes d4. And here I thought about d5, but after bishop d3, there's one important point. If I trade everything off on e4 and play bishop e6 and queen c2, here white is actually a little bit better because if I play f5, white can eat the pawn on c6. So I was very surprised when Vasif immediately played d4 here, because now after d5, bishop d3, I in fact decide to take. Now the computer prefers rook e8 here, leaving this big box of pawns, this big clump everywhere for both sides. But the line that I played is what I calculated when I played the move c6, which is I trade. And now after takes and bishop e6 here, you'll notice that when Vasif plays c4 and I go f5, he because he did not trade these pawns on c6 initially, now he can't take the pawn. So I think this was a big mistake to not trade on c6 initially. At this point, I thought I was doing very well. So we get the move bishop to b1. I go e4, knight d2. And here I decide to play this move c5. Now, this is all very, very thematic. When I go e4, what I'm trying to do is blunt the power of the light square b. And after knight d2, c5, how does this b get in the game? If white gets 20 moves, let's just illustrate the point here, and white can go bishop a2, you activate the bishop on another diagonal, and on top of that, you end up with a ton of oxygen for the horse to start jumping to c4, b3, and the knight is very, very good. So I go c5 here, white can't take, of course, because then you would hang the horse and lose the game. You get queen c3, and now I play the move b6. Now the point behind this is now you'll notice this b, how do you get in after takes, takes. This diagonal is simply closed. He can go here, but there's no way to force the pawn forward. So he, white is basically playing with a very bum light square B here, and it's very difficult to play. I suspect because of the positional issues for Vasif here and the fact that it was a must win, he goes on to sack the horse with knight takes pawn, takes and the move bishop e4. Now white has a very powerful wooden shield with the bishop on e4 here. It hits the knight and the bishop knight and the rook at the same time and here i play the move queen g5 guarding the knight and intending to recapture if he takes the rook with my own rook so we get takes takes and at this point it's important to take stock of the position 
In this position, white has a tower and two pawns in return for the bishop and a knight. But one of the big issues for white here is that white does not really have many pass pawns. You have one lone pass pawn that you can try to push forward, this B pawn. The E3 pawn is weak, G2 pawn is weak, and the C4 pawn is always under pressure. I have knight H4, knight E5. Computer says it's about zeros here, and I would agree with the assessment, but it feels very hard to play for the player with white pieces. So Vasif goes queen d3, I play rook e8. I could have played the other order with knight e5 first, but I decided to play rook e8 instead. We get b6, knight e5, queen e4, and here I play this move, knight takes c4. Now it's interesting, the computer prefers bishop d7 here to go bishop c6 and create some nice threats on the diagonal. This is a move that I simply did not see. So when I played knight c4, I calculated this line with b7, where I thought it was a brilliant idea with queen to d5, because now the rook covers a square, you can't push p, and I'm threatening to trade the queens. If white trades and goes rook b1, for example, after rook b8, I eliminate this pass pawn, and I should never really be in danger of losing the game. So Vasif plays rook f4, and here I play the move rook b8, an important move, by the way, because if I were to trade first, it's a little bit iffy because white's threatening to queen, the rook hits the bishop and the knight. Probably after king f7, I'm okay, but why do I want to allow this? So I go rook to b8 here, trying to win the pawn. You get queen takes queen, bishop takes, and now the move rook f5. Here I go bishop e6, and after rook c5 and rook b7, white still has a rook and a pawn in return for the bishop and the knight. But at this point, with no pass pawn here and the, the knight guarding this pawn, bishop guarding the knight, realistically, it's not going to be possible to win for the player with the white pieces. So Vasif goes e4. I play king h7. We get rook d1. And now I play the move rook b2, trying to go after this pawn on g2 with the move knight to e3, or the move rook to a2 to win the pawn on a4. We get rook d3. And here I play the move rook to a2, trying to win the pawn. And Vasif blunders here with the move rook c6. Now at this point, it pretty much is over. I don't know if I would have won the game, but I definitely would not have lost. If he plays something like rook c7 with the idea that after takes, he has rook g3, for example. At the very least, I can just go check, check, check till the end of time. And I think after king d1 here, I have check. And if king c1, I have rook d7. So white has to stay on e1. And again, I just start checking forever. And a draw is good enough because I won the first game. Basit plays rook c6 here, and now I have the na nasty move, knight to e5, forking the two rooks here, and here Dora Bailey resigns because there's nothing he can do. He can take the bishop, but with an extra horse on the board or even an extra extra bishop, just nothing for, uh, for white to do. So I play the move knight to e5, and I win the second game of the match. I win the match 2-0 against Dora Bailey. This means that I move on to the next round in the loser's bracket of Division 2 while Dora Bailey is eliminated. So... That's going to be it for today, but I hope you guys have enjoyed this recap from uh, the Crunchable Masters or Crunchable Labs Masters, whatever it's called, uh, which is part of the Chess Champions Tour being held on chess.com. If you are not already subscribed to the channel, make sure that you smash that subscribe button below, and we will be back tomorrow with some more great recaps from the Crunchable Masters. I'll see you guys soon. Have a good one. Bye.